Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Zoom education session on understanding and addressing late day restlessness, repetition, and agitation. Thank you so much for joining our discussion today. We hope that the information that we're about to share is helpful to you and it provides some insight on understanding behavior and some suggestions for addressing some of the most common responsive behaviors that caregivers, caregivers are often faced with when they're supporting someone that's living with dementia. My name is Chris Van Leuven, and joining me today to provide this information is Shelby Berry. We're both education coordinators at the Alzheimer's Society of Peterborough, Cortha Lakes, Northumberland, and Halliburton. I recognize, you know, throughout our discussion today, there might be several questions that come up. And as, you know, considering the topics that we're covering today, and just in the interest of time, and because I'm not always able to see the chat while I'm sharing my PowerPoint screen, I'm gonna ask you to hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Please feel free to jot down a question or ask a question in the chat so you don't forget to ask at the end. And Shelby and I will be sure to go through those questions at the end of today's session. Thanks so much for your help with this. The Alzheimer's Society of Peterborough, Fourth Lakes, Northumberland and Halliburton respect respectfully recognizes that our organization is located on the treaty and ancestral territory of the Michi, Saugig, Anishinaabeg people who were known as peacemakers among indigenous nations. We are grateful to the original stewards of this land. It is our goal for this land acknowledgement to be an active living statement of intent, which will build a bridge toward greater understanding and inclusion. This is the start of a conversation. We intend to listen and learn. All right, so to get started with our conversation about behavioral change, we first need to understand how the brain is impacted due to dementia. The disease process affects the brain in many different ways. A person with dementia can experience a variety of changes, including physical changes, cognitive changes, emotional, mental, and behavioral changes. Sometimes behavioral change occurs in response to an unmet need or as a result of changes in the brain. When faced with what we'll say is an unusual behavior, we need to remember these important points. Please. Behavior is a means of communication. Remember, I have a meeting. And perhaps, you know, when that person is no longer able to express themselves effectively through their verbal com communication, that's when we might see some of those behavior changes. There's always a meaning or a message behind the behavior. Most behavioral displays don't last too long. We often refer to behaviors exhibited by people living with dementia as time limited and episodic. In other words, the behaviors occur because of a trigger that's present. And once the behavior has escalated or been demonstrated, it usually subsides. Often the behavior is forgotten by the person with dementia due to their short-term memory loss. Most behavioral displays are the results of an unmet need. And it might be a need that they're not able to communicate effectively, um, for example, maybe they need to use the washroom, but they're not able to verbally communicate this need. And lastly here, difficult behavior is responsive behavior. Even though we call them sometimes challenging behaviors because the behavior themselves might be difficult for family members or caregivers to cope with, um, we have to understand that the person is not behaving in this way to be challenging. The behavior is simply in response to something that's happened, uh, maybe a trigger or an unmet need. Responsive behaviors are a common result of changes in the brain due to the progression of dementia. Here are some examples of the most common responsive behaviors that we might see a person living with dementia exhibit. And while these are considered common behavior changes, it's important to understand that each person is unique. Some may experience the majority of these behaviors, while others may demonstrate only a few. It all depends on the way that the brain is being affected 
due to dementia. It's key to remember that if you see any of these behaviors in a person living with dementia, that even if they seem out of the ordinary, strange, or completely different than the person's usual behavior, these behavioral changes are considered normal for someone living with dementia. The person's not demonstrating these behaviors on purpose. Again, there is a meaning behind the behavior. We have to be good detectives and try and figure out why a person might be acting in this way. We also have to keep remembering that the brain changes that are occurring can influence these seemingly unusual or strange behaviors. Well, it's important to acknowledge and be aware that many of these behaviors may be present at some point during the disease process. In this presentation, we're only gonna focus on three of these behaviors, the ones that we get asked about the most often. So today we're looking at late day restlessness, which we also you know, sometimes hear referred to as sundowning, repetition, and agitation. These behaviors seem to present in most people living with dementia and are often puzzling behaviors for family members and care partners to try to figure out and to know how to cope with them effectively when they occur. So I'm gonna hand things over to Shelby now, and she's gonna get us started with some information about late day restlessness. Great, thank you, Chris. So late day restlessness or sundowning is a symptom that can show up in people who have Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. When someone becomes uh, confused, anxious, uh, aggressive, agitated, restless, uh, consistently later in the day, usually in kind of the, the late afternoon, early evening hours, this is, is referred to as late day restlessness or uh, formerly uh, was referred to as sundowning, but they've, they've changed that term a bit. They often use late day restlessness now. It is thought that late day restlessness or sundowning can be a problem or an issue for as many as 66% of people with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias at some point. It can occur at any stage of the disease, but it tends to, to peak in the middle stages of dementia and, and then lessens as the disease progresses. Late day restlessness often affects uh, the person's quality of life and it can be exhausting for the caregiver as well. The person with dementia uh, at this time may become suspicious, upset, or disoriented. They may see or hear things that, that are not there, or perhaps believe, uh, that, um, believe things that are not actually true. So these could be some examples of things that are happening at this time of the day. So some behaviors are typical with late day restlessness, and um, these behaviors are listed here. So they may include becoming uh, demanding or showing aggression perhaps towards others, experiencing uh, delusions and hallucinations. So uh, here we might see, or the person might be seeing or hearing things that are not there. Pacing or wandering. So we might notice that the person has a hard time maybe just sitting down and sitting in the same spot and they kind of constantly need to be up and moving. Doing impulsive things. So, uh, you know, not being kind of content with where they're at, we might be noticing that there's more impulsive behavior. Attempting to leave home. So this can be a, a, a form of late day restlessness where someone is, is looking to be somewhere else, you know, saying that they want to go home, for example. Having difficulty understanding what others are saying to them. So that comprehension might become more difficult during this time of the day. And also having difficulty doing tasks that were done without difficulty earlier in the day. So that time of day is presenting more challenges with task completion. A variety of events or issues can trigger late day restlessness or sundowning behavior. So these can include uh, being tired at the end of the day, both physically and mentally. And this can, can contribute to the inability to 
to cope with stress or just that sum of this the stimulation of the day. So being exhausted both mentally and physically. Low or reduced uh, lighting and more shadows in the environment uh, can be a contributing factor because this can create uh, more confusion, fear, or uh, anxiety or hallucinations, especially when uh, common or familiar objects uh, in that environment look different because it's darker. So it can kind of it might play tricks on the person. Another contributing factor could be um, disruption in their circadian cycles. So that's our that's our sleep wake cycle or sleep wake patterns. And this disruption might be because of those brain changes um, as a result of dementia. So the person um, with dementia, if they're affected by this, they may have a more difficult time uh, distinguishing between uh, day and night, or they may get their days and their nights mixed up, which could contribute to this, this uh, late day restlessness. Another contributing factor could be um, the person not having as much or having no activity in the afternoon compared to the morning. And this might, might lead to uh, some of that agitation or restlessness later in the day. Boredom and sleeping a lot during the day can also trigger late day restlessness, um, as can having a lack of routine in the person's day. So that predictable routine can be so important um, for helping with this. Disorientation or confusion, um, that could be a, a possible trigger just with that tiredness and with that time of day, you know, this might be more likely for the person. And again, as we mentioned, one of the possible triggers or causes could be the person wanting to go home. And often, you know, even if the person is living in their home uh, that maybe they've lived in for many years, because of the, the changes with the brain and the changes with um with memory in particular, if the person's accessing more of their long-term memories, they may actually be talking about returning to a childhood home. So even though they're in their current home, they may um, be thinking that they're living in a previous home that they lived in. So their current home does not look familiar to them. So finding a way to respond to late day restlessness uh, may take some trial and error. Every person is different. Uh, every person living with dementia is different and may react differently uh, if they are experiencing this behavior. Some ways to try to uh, avoid a uh, sundowning episode or to alleviate or lessen it uh, once it has started are, are listed here on the screen and we'll go through uh, a few different um, slides with some strategies here. So first, see if the behavior is being caused by discomfort. This discomfort, uh, especially if there's communication changes with the person and they can't um, communicates their needs as well as they could before, um, this could really contribute. So this, this discomfort could be hunger, if the person is feeling hungry. It could be thirst, you know, maybe they haven't had enough water in the day, they're feeling a bit dehydrated. It could be a need to use the bathroom that's contributing to the restlessness, or perhaps they have um, some sort of physical pain or discomfort that they're having a hard time um, communicating about the need to relieve that. Another strategy here is to allow for a rest and naps between activities to allow time for the brain to rest. So on the, one of the previous slides, we said that the person might be physically and mentally exhausted by the end of the day. So just keeping in mind at how much their brain is kind of working throughout the day. So by the end of the day, you know, their brain may very well be exhausted. So if we can provide those periods of rest in between activities, that might be helpful. We can consider avoiding um, making appointments, bathing, or other potentially stressful activities. Um, avoid doing those in the late afternoon or evening. If we know that those activities might increase that stress or agitation for the person, then they might be better um, for suited for a different time of day, perhaps in the morning. 
prevent overstimulation from the television or radio, which can sometimes contribute to increased confusion. So if we feel that that might be something that's contributing to um, some overstimulation, we could look into making some changes there. Provide adequate, adequate lighting to lessen shadows when it begins to get dark. Increased lighting will help the person to identify objects and people more clearly in, in their environment. And research actually shows that the use of pink light bulbs um, can be effective for people living with dementia. The pink lighting offers um, an illuminating light that is not too harsh and does not create um, as much glare. So it might be less likely to kind of play, play tricks on the person. And some people have found that a, a rocking chair can be a really um, helpful strategy for, for providing that kind of uh, stimulation in terms of like that, that constant maybe movement while also having that calming effect for the person. Okay. So here are some more strategies that may help. So we can plan and encourage activities um, during the day. So <clears throat> making sure that that person maybe has that, that kind of routine of activities. Brisk walks or other forms of physical activity throughout the day may reduce uh, restlessness or the need to wander later. So if we can you know, incorporate that into their routine and, and get that person kind of moving throughout the day. Keep the person um, active and distracted when late day restlessness may occur. So for example, um, preparing dinner or setting the table, we could maybe uh, engage the person in that. You know, maybe they liked um, peeling potatoes or maybe they like setting the table, uh, inviting them to help you with those activities. And try to schedule uh, calming activities when agitation usually occurs. So activities that we know might bring um, a sense of calm to that person. I sometimes share the example of um, my mother-in-law's mother had dementia and she would often go visit her and she was often um, restless and agitated. And she would bring her a bag of green beans because when she had fond memories of her mom in the kitchen, kind of snipping the ends off of the green beans, and she just loved doing that. So she would bring the green beans and set the bag on the table, and she said, sure enough, my mom would go over, and she would start doing just that with the green beans, and it, it helped her have something to do with her hands, and it kind of brought that sense of calm during the, the visit, and sometimes the conversation flowed a bit easier, too. So just keeping in mind what might be calming, and often that's unique to the person. Allow quiet time um, if this helps decrease agitation. So again, working in those quiet periods of time. We can also consider um, the, the person's intake of caffeine and sugar, and perhaps restricting the amount of caffeine or sugar that the person has in the morning and throughout the day, because that might be contributing. <clears throat> And as best we can, trying to maintain a regular eating and sleep schedule can be helpful, um, you know, especially if someone might be having a hard time communicating that they're hungry, making sure that they're having um, something to eat in those snacks throughout the day. Some more strategies here um, to consider. So that you hear some of the final strategies that we have for you. It may be helpful to keep um, a daily journal to help uh, pinpoint some of the potential causes of uh, these late day restlessness symptoms and to see which strategies help. So sometimes people, if, if this is something that's happening with a frequency, they'll kind of jot down, okay, this is what was happening. Um, this is what I did. This is this helped or this didn't help. And also just helping to maybe try to pinpoint any, any themes, um, any possible triggers. So that journal can be helpful sometimes. Familiar routines may help the person feel more secure. So with dementia, routines are so helpful because they can provide that, that comfort and predictability about how the day may play out, you know, when, when memory is changing. Um, but some of these routines uh, could include uh, readying the home for the evening. So for example, 
um, closing the curtains in those those late late afternoon hours and turning on the lights or you know bedtime routines that include warm milk and soft music so kind of working in um, any of those calming uh, calming routines might be helpful. We could also consider changing sleeping arrangements. So for example, adding a comfortable chair to the room, a night light, or leaving the door open, you know, any of these things that we think might help the person. And also consider providing any um, items of comfort for the person. So it might be a, a favorite pillow or a blanket. Sometimes people, um, have tried uh, even those the weighted blankets for that kind of uh, effect that it provides almost like having a, a, a warm hug almost with that weighted blanket. And also provide reassurance and reminisce as a distraction. So if we see that someone is maybe agitated or restless in these late afternoon hours, if, if we know that there is, um, maybe a, a topic of conversation they really like to talk about. Uh, often reminiscing works well with dementia uh, if, if that short-term memory isn't available to the person, but they have more vivid long-term memories. We can think about you know, some of those memories that are strongest for them and some of those topics of conversation they like to talk about. And that might be a, a helpful distraction to bring up some of those topics or bring out that photo book to look through together, for example. And lastly, um, doctors may recommend certain medications to ease the symptoms. Uh, for example, uh, antipsychotics, sedatives, or sleep regulating hormones such as uh, melatonin. These can help some people, but because they may have um, serious side effects such as dizziness, uh, sedation, so causing maybe um, increased sleepiness, uh, or a side effect may also be dependence, it is recommended that all of the other options be tried before uh, relying on, on drugs. So this is something that would certainly need to be um, talked over and discussed with your doctor. <clears throat> so let's take a moment now to look at a common scenario and identify some of the do's and don'ts um, for this situation involving late day restlessness. So this first scenario applies to a person that is visiting with, uh, with Hannah. So this could be someone visiting Hannah in her home or in uh, the long-term care home. So after a short visit around 4.30 p.m., Hannah becomes upset, paces the room and says, I want to get out of here now. So here are some things that we could do in this situation. So due to the late afternoon hour, it would be helpful to turn on um, lights or lamps in the room to reduce shadows and to, to help illuminate the space um, because maybe the space isn't looking familiar to Hannah anymore because of that, that change with the lighting. We could close the, the drapes to lessen um, shadows and to eliminate any glare on the windows, um, which may be contributing to her feeling unsettled. We could also consider providing um, light exercise or activity in the morning, which may help um, to avoid or alleviate some of this negative pent up energy that, that may be kind of starting to build later in the day. We could also have uh, Hannah engage in a familiar task, like setting the table uh, for the evening meal, for example, if that's something she enjoys. And if the late afternoon is not a good time for Hannah, we could try to arrange um, for a visit perhaps earlier in the day, um, if, if that would be a better time to visit with Hannah. Here are a couple of things that we likely want to avoid doing when it comes to Hannah's situation. We do not simply want to request that Hannah be prescribed medication to help calm her. In many situations where anti-anxiety medications are used, it can result in the person uh, sleeping or being excessively drowsy um, for the remainder of the day. We also don't want to tell Hannah to calm down or to stop pacing around. 
um, this may actually end up having the reverse reaction than it was intended. And, and Hannah may uh, actually become more upset or agitated. So I'll hand things back over to Chris and she's going to um, highlight uh, repetition, one of our other behavior changes. Thanks, Shelby. Yeah, so the second behavior that <clears throat> we're gonna discuss in our time together today is repetition. If we were to take a poll of the most challenging behaviors that caregivers find themselves having to respond to, the repetition would be one of the top contenders. Repetition can certainly test a caregiver's patience because, you know, it's particularly difficult to know how to avoid it or how to stop it when it occurs. Repetitive behaviors can include repeating a sound, a word, a question, or an action. So for example, maybe the person is tapping their fingers or drumming their fingers. Repetition can be both verbal, um, also referred to as perseverating, when the person might repeat the same question, or it can be physical, so repetitive movements, like maybe rubbing the person's hands together again and again. Repetitive actions and repetitive questioning, as with any behavior, has a cause. Sometimes it's the result of changes in the brain. In dementia, changes um, or damage to the front area of the brain, which controls initiation, can lead to this perseveration. With verbal perseveration, the same thing is repeated over and over again, like a music CD that's skipping. The person with dementia likely has no insight or control over this behavior. Unfortunately, people who perseverate can sometimes be characterized as attention seekers. In truth, the person has little to no insight or control over this due to the changes that are continuing to happen within their brain. Understanding the reasons behind specific behaviors can help caregivers to cope. So there's several possible triggers or causes for this repetitive behavior. Anxiety, pain, or discomfort can sometimes result in repetitive behaviors. Possible side effects of medications, particularly when the person's uh, repeating a physical movement. So if that's the case, we want to make sure that we're, we're speaking to the person's doctor about it. Another cause of, of repetitive behavior can be an inability to express needs. Um, and those needs could be things like hunger or needing to use the washroom. So for example, if a person is um, fidgeting with their clothes, it may be a sign that they need to use the bathroom. Another cause could be, you know, that the person's just trying to express an emotion such as fear or anger, or maybe they're having feelings of insecurity or loss. Loneliness could be another reason. So if the person is, you know, has been separated from their spouse or family member or care partner, um, then we might notice that the person is continually asking or repeatedly asking, you know, where is my husband? Misinterpretation of one's surroundings. So maybe they're hearing sounds, for example, and that can cause some anxiety. So the person with dementia might mimic the sound that they're hearing and keep repeating it. Another cause of repetition could be boredom or understimulation. So the person is kind of looking to fill that, that void. A stressful environment or overstimulation could also be at the root cause. And due to the memory loss associated with dementia, the person, because they have changes to their short-term memory, may not be aware that they're repeating themselves or they may be asking a question and you may have answered that question several times, but because of that short-term memory loss, they don't recognize that you've already they've already asked and you've already answered. So here we have some strategies that might be helpful. First, we want to determine if the behavior actually needs to be changed. So if it's not causing any harm or if it's possible to ignore it, um, then we may not need to do anything. But remember here, I just want to highlight that we're remembering to ignore the behavior and not the person. 
So if we can kind of put it out of my out of your mind that the person might be tapping repeatedly, try and ignore the tapping sound, but don't um, don't ignore the person in the process. Next, we want to listen carefully to the person with dementia. So uh, making eye contact with them and showing them that you're concerned about their needs can be helpful. Really kind of looking for that emotion behind their message and responding to the emotion. It's not necessarily helpful to remind the person with dementia that they've already asked this question. So if, if they've asked a question repeatedly, uh, what we find, it, it's helpful if we always keep our calm tone and answer the question in the same way that we've answered it the first time. Sometimes using touch to communicate instead of words, you know, if it's appropriate to the person in the situation, that can be helpful. Using memory aids, so writing notes or making signs or using uh, big, having a large clock that you can refer to or uh, maybe a big calendar or whiteboard. Those are tools that you can use to help to orient the person. We also find keeping routines consistent or you know, always kind of following a similar schedule can help uh, curb the repetition. And, and lastly, on this, on this part of the list, avoiding getting angry. So we wanna remain patient. It's not always the easiest thing to do, but keep in mind that the person is not asking the question or repeating the movement to annoy you. They're not doing it on purpose, but it is a result of the disease and the changes that are occurring in their brain. We have a few more strategies here that can be helpful. Uh, sometimes we're able to distract the person or redirect the person with either another activity um, or a change in conversation or a change in venue. Um, so maybe even just distracting the person with a snack, like a bowl of ice cream or a cup of tea or going for a walk together. Those are some suggestions. Reassuring the person with dementia. So you can reassure them by addressing their feelings rather than their questions or their actions. Looking for patterns in the behavior. So, um, you know, sometimes we need to be detectives and get out our notebook and, and note the time of day that we're seeing this behavior change. Know what events are going on um, or maybe other people who are involved that might be triggering the behavior. If you can identify the pattern, then it makes it easier to remove that trigger. So for example, a person that sees their coat hanging by the front door and their shoes on the mat inside the front door might be triggered by seeing these things. And that's the reason that they're asking again and again to go out. But if we take their coat and we take the shoes away and we tuck them in the closet, kind of out of sight, out of mind, that can help reduce the trigger for this behavior. Also modifying the environment based on the trigger. So once you know what's causing the behavior, uh, for example, maybe it's a television show that's creating anxiety and we now know to avoid that show in the future. Or maybe it's the mirror that's hanging in the bedroom that's causing the person to see another person in their room. And if we can either take the mirror right out or cover it up, that helps to remove the trigger for the person. Checking in with the person's doctor is always important, just in case that it's the medications that the person's taking that's causing the repetitive behaviors. Having the person with dementia do some activities that require repetitive movements or actions. So uh, that could be going for a walk, that could be giving the person a uh, Swiffer duster and getting them to do some dusting or maybe sanding a piece of wood or folding some laundry. Giving the person an activity that's gonna occupy their hands can help keep them away from that, that perseverative behavior that you're, you've been seeing or noticing. When we are talking to the person, particularly when we're giving instructions, it's really important that we only give one idea at a time, keep those instructions short and simple, and always just be aware of your tone of voice. We wanna be calm and as reassuring as possible. And lastly here on our list, sometimes playing music, um, nice soft music or music that the person really enjoys, 
that can have a calming effect. So that's a, another suggestion. So we've got a couple of, uh, or we've got a scenario here um, when it comes to repetitive behavior. Lily continually asks why her mother hasn't visited, even though she passed away many years ago. So let's look at what we could do in this situation. First, let's respond to the emotion behind Lily's question. Is Lily asking for her mother because she's feeling lonely or insecure or sad? Then we can ask Lily to tell us more about her mother. So allowing Lily that opportunity to reminisce about her mom using family photos and sharing some stories can be really helpful because they can foster feelings of warmth and comfort in place of actually having her mother present. Here are some things that we want to avoid when we're noticing the uh, repetitious Repet sorry, repetitive behavior, um, like with Lily's scenario. So we want to avoid saying things like, well, don't you remember your mother died 25 years ago? You know better than that. Your mother would be 113 if she was still alive. That's not going to be helpful for the person. Um, chances are that due to the changes in their memory, they may not recognize that their mom has died. They may think that the year is different than it is, that they're younger than they are. So by saying it like that, we're really just um, upsetting the person. So we're better to take that more caring approach and have the person, you know, talk about their mom or reminisce about their mom and look at those pictures rather than kind of reality orient the person. Okay, the final behavior that we're gonna address in our session today is agitation. It's not uncommon for the person living with dementia to experience agitation due to those changes that they're experiencing in their world. A person with dementia might feel anxious or agitated at particular times and in certain circumstances. The person might become restless um, and that, you know, causes that need for them to want to move around or pace about. The person might become upset in certain places or environments or when they're focused on specific details of a task or a situation. Anxiety and agitation might be caused by a number of different medical conditions, medication interactions, or by circumstances that worsen the person's ability to think. Ultimately, the person with dementia is experiencing a profound loss of their ability to negotiate and perceive new information from their environment. And it's a direct result of how the disease is impacting their brain. Environmental changes, uh, such as a change to the person's living arrangements, maybe they've moved to a new home, um, maybe they've moved to a new retirement home or a long-term care home, or possibly they've been put in the hospital environment. The person might experience agitation due to the presence of house guests if they're moving to a different home. So um, now if they've moved in with their, their son and their daughter-in-law, for example, maybe they're getting used to having the grandchildren around and they're, they're trying to negotiate that. Or maybe they are experiencing agitation if travel is involved in moving to a new environment. So if they're in a whole new city, that's another layer. You might notice agitation as well if there's changes in the caregiver arrangements. So the person might be adjusting to new care providers that they might not be familiar with. They might feel a sense of loneliness or loss if a previous caregiver is no longer there to provide that care, or if they're not present on a regular basis in the same way they were. The person might experience agitation because they are having some fear and fatigue resulting from trying to make sense of a world that is now confusing for them. So common fears that we see include fears of bathing, uh, fears of an unknown surrounding, or even a fear of having their clothes changed. They might experience agitation or anxiety 
as a result of misperceived threats in their environment. Uh, for example, if a care prov provider that they're not really familiar with um, is helping them with personal care, maybe trying to remove their clothes for a bath, then the person feels threatened if they're not fully aware or fully understanding that caregiver's intentions. Another thing that we don't often think about, but dehydration, that can be a cause of agitation, you know, not getting enough to drink. Or feeling overwhelmed or confused can lead to anxiety um, or agitation as well. So we're gonna look at another one of those scenarios. During a visit with a friend, oh, I'm sorry. I got a little confused there. Um, sorry, we're going to now look at some strategies that might help with agitation. So first of all, redirecting the person's attention. That can be helpful. So we want to remain calm um, in our interaction with the person and always try and keep the mood light, keep it positive. We can also use visual and verbal cues or gestures to help the person understand the message that we're attempting to communicate. Um, so, you know, if we're offering the person a drink of water, sometimes it's a good idea to mimic that drink or um, show and point, that can be helpful. Doing our best to create a calm environment for the person can be really helpful. So removing any potential stressors, uh, this might involve moving the person to a safer or quieter place. We can offer the person a security object. So maybe that's a blanket or a stuffed animal, giving the person rest and allowing the person some privacy as well. We want to try soothing rituals. Um, so, you know, having a nice warm bath, maybe having a diffuser going with some nice scent, that could be helpful. And limiting the, as Shelby had mentioned before, limiting the amount of caffeine, that stimulant in the person's diet. Also trying to avoid some environmental triggers. So noise, uh, that's a big environmental trigger. Glare, if we've got a lot of windows happening. And background distractions. So having the television on, having the radio on, all of those things can act as triggers. We can try simplifying tasks and routines so that they're not as overwhelming for the person. So breaking things down into steps um, and make sure that we're only giving kind of one instruction at a time. Monitoring the person's personal comfort. So checking for pain or asking the person about pain, um, making sure that we're addressing any dietary needs, keeping the person um, well-fed, making sure that they're not thirsty. Uh, constipation is something that we need to be aware of. Um, making sure that the person just doesn't need a washroom break. Uh, making sure that the person's getting as, as good a sleep as they can or napping uh, to eliminate fatigue. Checking for infection um, and even checking for things like rashes or dry skin, any kind of skin irritation. Making sure that the room is set at a comfortable temperature, um, especially as we're approaching winter here. Sometimes it takes a bit to, to get that thermostat right. Being sensitive to fears um, and any kind of misperceived threats that the person might have in the room or frustration with expressing what it is that they're wanting. We also wanna provide opportunities for exercise. So that can be very simple. It can be going for a walk together, getting out in the garden together, uh, putting on some music and dancing. Whenever possible, provide the person with options and simple choices. So limiting one, limiting your choices to one or two options can avoid overwhelming the person. So rather than uh, what shirt do you want to wear today? Maybe just limiting it to, would you like the blue shirt or would you like the red shirt today? That can be helpful. Okay, so let's take a look at a scenario involving a man who's experiencing agitation. During a visit with a friend, Jim fidgets, he picks out his clothes and he's restless. First, let's look at some of the things that we could do or things that we could try. 
making an appointment with the doctor so that Jim can have that full medical assessment, a really good checkout checkup to rule out any potential infections, uh, to address anything that's treatable, um, and to review the medications that Jim's taking. That could be a good starting point. We could consider if Jim's experiencing either overstimulation or understimulation, and if that's what's causing him to be agitated. We can look at the person's environment to determine if there's any triggers that might be unsettling. So is the environment maybe too bright for Jim? Or is there too much noise in the environment for Jim to feel comfortable? We could give him something to hold or something to do with his hands, like holding a dusting cloth or um, holding some napkins. We could also try distracting. distracting. Um, we could use calming music to do this. We could look at a book of photos together or we could play a game together. We could also take a moment and connect with Jim, um, reminiscing with him about maybe a happy memory that he really enjoys talking about. And we can also just make sure that we're checking in with him because maybe he's growing tired and we need to allow him some time to rest and reset. When it comes to this scenario, let's look at some of the things that we're gonna to wanna to avoid. So we want to avoid asking Jim to stop fidgeting and picking at his clothes. So asking him to stop just isn't an effective strategy and it could produce further agitation. Maybe Jim becomes even angry that, that we're asking him to stop. We also don't wanna tell Jim to calm down. Um, really, we should just take the words calm down out of our vocabulary because nobody likes to hear that. Uh, but telling Jim to calm down might have that reverse reaction to what was intended. And we need to avoid raising our voice and becoming upset ourselves. So this, you know, this is hard, um, especially when in the, in the heat of the moment. But if we can step back, um, try and give ourselves a moment to regulate our own emotions, um, that can be the most helpful because if we're getting upset, if the temperature in the room is rising, this can also act as a trigger to escalate Jim's behavior. All right, so I'm gonna turn things back over to Shelby now that we've covered those three behavior changes and uh, we're just rounding, rounding out the presentation now and coming to the end. Thank you, Chris. So despite the changes that come with dementia and knowing how to, to respond to some of these behaviors that may become challenging for caregivers to address, we still want to find the most successful ways to connect with the person living with dementia and to enjoy our time together. So here are some ideas for making um, positive connections using what we call the seven R's. So we hope that this is um, a helpful way to remember the important aspects of connecting uh, with the person, because as we saw with many of those strategies we talked about today, they are about connection with that person. So we want to keep these in mind. So the first R is to repeat. So as we highlighted today, dementia causes memory loss. So we need to do our best um, to, to be patient and to provide gentle reminders and repeat as needed. And often repeat as if it's the first time that the person has asked the question. The next is to reassure. So providing um, frequent reassurance can help the person to, to remain calm. So reassuring them, kind of validating uh, that, that emotion beyond the, the restlessness or the agitation as we talked about. Redirect. So if something is making the person upset, we can try to engage them in a different activity or topic that they enjoy. So uh, we, we mentioned some of these strategies, but maybe we redirect them with, you know, a, a favorite drink or snack that we know that they like, maybe a topic of conversation or an activity that we know um, can be helpful. When memory loss um, is, is very short, it can be a lot easier to redirect and, and distract someone. So some of those strategies might, might work if we know it's a, a go-to that they enjoy. 
The next is to reminisce. So long-term memories are often very vivid. So a person with dementia may enjoy talking about their earlier life or maybe looking at, at old um, photographs. So reminiscing with the person, um, if their story has maybe some facts that aren't correct or the story's kind of changed over time, uh, that's okay. You know, let, let their story be their story, um, even if it's maybe a bit different than how it historically happened. It's the reminiscing and the connection that's important. Reorient yourself. So step into the reality of the person living with dementia here. Try to see the, the world as they may be seeing it. Uh, this will help you to understand uh, their actions and to, to come up with some, some ways, some maybe some creative ways to help them. And the next R is to reflect. So here we're, we're talking about taking time to consider uh, your actions as, as the caregiver. So consider how your approach um, may be affecting the person with dementia. So reflecting on kind of what, what we're doing. And then the last R here is to check their response. So if the person is becoming calmer, less confused and less agitated, uh, keep doing what you're doing. If not, we might need to stop and try something else. So, you know, the key here is to don't give up. Uh, a strategy that works one day may not work the next day. Uh, that's, that's what kind of makes this a trial and error process. Um, but we need to ensure that we try to remain flexible and adaptable um, to, to find those strategies that might work best for the person in the moment. So hopefully those seven R's are helpful to you. So as we um, conclude today's presentation, uh, please remember that when we are presented with a, unusual or uncharacteristic behavior, uh, that all behavior has meaning. So changes in behavior are, are a result of the disease process. Um, the brain changes as a result of the impact of dementia and therefore abilities, communication and behavior. These are all you know, um, contributing to those behavior changes. As best as we can, we also uh, want to try not to take any behavior personally. So the person with dementia is trying to cope with their, their changing world, their changing abilities, uh, the best that they can, in, an, in a way that seems reasonable to them. They may no longer um, be able to use uh, empathy and reasoning uh, to understand how the behavior or response to the trigger is impacting you, the caregiver. So, so they're just trying their, to do their best with kind of the, the brain that they have. So sometimes they may not be able to consider how their behavior is affecting someone else. Look for the person behind the disease. So here we want to avoid defining the person by the diagnosis or by the results of their changing brain. You know, we want to know that that person is still there. And often what we know about that person can be some of the most helpful information for figuring out how we might uh, respond to a behavior change. <clears throat> with dementia and, and all of the changes that come with it, we, we often tend to focus on the losses uh, of the person living with dementia. We can easily get caught up in uh, thinking about what the person can no longer do or an ability that's been lost, you know, a task that they're no longer able to engage in or maybe a hobby that they no longer have interest in. So it's it's also important to recognize and, and build on the person's remaining strengths and abilities. So what they still enjoy doing and are able to do, uh, perhaps in, in maybe a slightly different way or with modifications or adaptations in place. So looking for those remaining strengths and seeing how we can help, help support them. And lastly, you know, as best we can focus on the positive, um, even when, when things are particularly challenging. So um, doing that as best as we can can sometimes be helpful. So we, we recognize that living and supporting someone with dementia uh, is not easy, and we want you to know that you are not alone and that the Alzheimer's Society is here to help. 
We have a range of supportive services designed to assist you um, in your journey. So on the slide, you'll see a picture of Maddie. She's our intake coordinator, and she is your first point of contact with the Alzheimer's Society and can connect you with the right person and the right resources to meet your needs. So if, if you are kind of connecting with us for the first time through virtual education and you want to learn more about the programs and services we have available, we, we encourage you to reach out and give Maddie a call. And while a portion of uh, funding for the Alzheimer's Society is provided through the Ministry of Health and various grant opportunities, not all of the services we offer um, fall under these programs. This is why we are so uh, grateful for the support we receive from our generous donors. Gifts from donors allow us to go above and beyond the basic level of programs and services. Inclusive and innovation, pro, uh, innovative programs like our Minds in Motion program, for example, are only possible thanks to the generosity and kindness of our donors. So we just want to take a moment here um, today to, to recognize and, and, and thank our donors um, and express that gratitude. So thank you so much to all of our donors. Okay, so that concludes our presentation for today. So I'm just going to pause the recording here and then we'll stop sharing the screen um, and address any questions that you might have.